I uh, co-edited a book that was published and uh, published it with um, one of the theology professors at Southwestern Seminary and another theology professor at New Orleans Seminary. And uh, uh, we thought it was a pretty good book. It's on the doctrine of salvation and, and it's uh, especially with respect to Reformed theology. And so just last month it was published in Portuguese. So, um, yes, so anyone can be saved is now todos podem ser salvos. So um, if, if you read Portuguese and would like to read it in Portuguese, just let me know and I'll, I'll get you one of these. So, and I'll tell you, it's, a, it's, it's a, a very specifically on the doctrine of salvation. And as we get ready to take that up, uh, and that will be in the starting next week, I'll be referring more, distinct, uh, more specifically to this book and to some of the things that are in it. If you would like a copy of this book, let me know. I probably need to order some more just because over, over some time I've, I've uh, uh, made available uh, most of the copies that I have. So, uh, but we will be referring, or I'll be using what I learned in the, in the process of putting this book together. Um, and I'll probably, there's, there's a, a longer and more interesting story. I, I produced a statement, I guess it's been about 10 years ago now, uh, laying out the laying out what I believe the distinctions were between Southern Baptists who would, who would affirm Reformed theology and Southern Baptists who would not reform, uh, affirm Reformed theology. And it, it, we published it on a website, uh, on a blog, and for about a week it was the most accessed religious blog in the world. So, it got a lot of interest, and so that it started about a year-long or 18-month-long process for me. Of, 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 uh, I, I, I preached at several of the seminaries and uh, did some uh, interviews and that kind of thing. So, uh, um, so I'll share some of that story with you as well. You might find that interesting. Also, if you ever just if you Google me and you Google the word Calvinism, you'll get lots of interesting videos and. Uh, comments and uh, articles and that sort of thing. So if you just want to have fun with that, uh, please do so. And uh, also, I just wanted you to know that one of my co-editors, Adam Harwood, is the head of the theology department at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and he just published his systematic theology, his great big systematic theology. It's the, it's, uh, the first Southern Baptist systematic theology that, that uh, does not come from a reformed position that's been published in probably 50 years or more out of, out of Southern Baptist life. So uh, kind of a note, noteworthy for a lot of reasons. And so I have not had a chance to read it, but uh, probably it's the text we'll use and when I teach systematic theology again when, whenever I do so. So I thought that was pretty cool. His name's Adam Harwood, and if you're looking for a, another systematic theology to add to a theology for the church, um, uh, th this is a good one, all right? So, and then finally, I just thought you might find it interesting. This, uh, the article from our textbook for this week was written by R. Stanton Norman. And Stan Norman, uh, I was his grader in seminary. And what that means is, is he taught the class and gave the test and I graded all of his tests and all of his, his papers. And so, um, got to know uh, Dr. Norman through that at New Orleans. And I know this is going online, and he'll probably contest this, and, and we have, a, we have a, a, a fun relationship. But he really fired me from being his grader. He would say he didn't fire me from being his grader, but I, I was his grader, and then we had a conversation, and then I wasn't his grader anymore. And so I don't know how else you, uh, you, uh, uh, you define that. <laughs> Maybe surprising to some of you, but I was kind of nitpicky. Uh, in the way I graded, and uh, he thought I was giving the students too hard of a time, and I thought I wasn't giving the students too hard of a time, and then I wasn't as grader anymore. So, uh, the, uh, I still bust his chops over uh, uh, being the first person to fire me. So, anyway, but several of the guys in this text that you're reading, I have had the, the privilege of knowing, and so Russ Moore and I uh, went to seminary together. David Dockery and I served on a, a Calvinism advisory committee. Timothy George. I uh, uh, also served on that advisory committee, Chad Brand, uh, and my dad co-authored 
the book that's used at seminary to teach proper program. Um, and then Stan Norman, uh, Danny Aiken is a president of one of the seminaries and we've known each other. Paige Patterson is Chuck Kelly's brother-in-law uh, and I've known him off and on across the years. Malcolm Yarnell who wrote uh, the person and work of the Holy Spirit was my uh, one of my advisors on my dissertation at Southwestern Seminary, so I know him real well, and he he a contributor to our book. Um, <coughs> Mark Dever and I served on that committee together, uh, and Albert Moeller and I, uh, Dr. Moeller's the president of Southern Seminary, and I preached at Southern, and then we did a Q and A about Calvinism and Reformed theology uh, together. So it's it sort of dawned on me that I know a lot of the guys that wrote these. Uh, articles. I thought that was kind of cool. So there you go. Well, let me lead us in prayer and then we'll jump into uh, the, our look at the doctrine of human sinfulness. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for uh, all your goodness to us through Christ Jesus. We thank you for bringing us here tonight and we pray that you would enliven our minds so that we would understand who you are and in understanding who you are, we'll understand who we are and then we'll understand what it is you want us to do. Lord, especially as we take a look at the doctrine of human sinfulness, it's not an easy thing to look at. It's a, it's a sorry state of affairs that we have brought about through our uh, rejection and rebellion against you uh, across the generations and millennia. And yet also, Lord, we, we recognize that, uh, uh, that even in light of our constant, the constant human impulse to run from you uh, is not outmatched by your constant desire uh, to redeem and rescue us uh, from uh, the mess that we made. Lord, we're all poster children of that reality, that you are a savior of sinners. And so, Lord, help us to, uh, to take a look at that, even though it's hard to look at. Help us to uh, uh, come to understand how to integrate our understanding of human sinfulness so that we can understand the, 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 the magnitude of our salvation, uh, the greatness of who you are, the greatness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us also to recognize that um, the sin that we're going to talk about costs your son his life. Help us to recognize that uh, the, uh, the power of sin has been broken over those that have trusted in uh, Christ Jesus. And so our lives ought to look like it. We ought to be new creation people living in a completely different way as the people who have been set free. And I, I pray that you will help us to know the, uh, and, and have a fresh appreciation for the cost of sin, for its consequences, and also for the hope that lies beyond um, life uh, in, in the prison of sin. Lord, we, we love you. We thank you for uh, Jesus Christ who makes all things possible. It's in his name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, we are looking together at the doctrine of humanity, uh, which is one of those central uh, dynamics of uh, systematic theology. Remember, you can break systematic theology down into God, humanity, and salvation. And so we're in that middle section, humanity. Uh, and you can break, or at least for our purposes, we're breaking the doctrine of humanity. Uh, last week, we, or last time we were together, we looked at the doctrine of human nature. And now we're looking specifically uh, at the doctrine of human sinfulness. And this is one, on one of the occasions that really puts uh, the value and the structure of systematic theology on display. Remember, systematic theology is a discipline that seeks to go all the way through the Bible. And the Bible does not lay itself out to us systematically. It doesn't lay itself out to us in, in clear-cut uh, topics, but it has more of a narrative form. It has a salvation history form. And so if you're going to pull together a particular doctrine and you want to root it in the truth of the Bible, then you've got to go all the way through the Bible and find all the places that the Bible talks about a certain thing and pull all those um, scriptures together and then begin to do a synthesis of, of what the Bible's message is about a particular doctrine. And you may be shocked to know this, but the Bible talks a lot about sin. Uh, have you ever noticed that? Okay, the Bible talks a lot about sin. There are a lot of words for sin. We're not going to go through all of that that's available. Uh, Dr. Norman uh, does a great job in his article of, of really helping us to, to be rooted in all the ways and the terminology uh, that the Bible uses to talk about sin. Uh, but we, uh, it is a great picture of, of the process of moving from uh, all the different things that the Bible will have to say about sin and then how to pull that together in order to make a coherent um, statement about the Bible's message concerning this doctrine. And so uh, keep your eye on that because that's the whole point of systematic theology. 
And so we begin, as we always do, I, I want to help you not to lose the, the, the forest for the trees. And there are a lot of trees in systematic theology. I think you've come to know that. There's a lot of detail in this. And so we begin again with our fundamental theological declaration. One of the things that helps to keep things organized when you think about systematic theology is having a core idea. And so it, it's uh, my view, and this just is sort of original with me, uh, although it's the product of a, a whole lot of study of a whole lot of different systematic theologies, that, that when you want to say what Christian theology, what the message of Christian theology is in a, in a sentence, well, I've laid it out for you there in that theological declaration at the top of your notes. The God of the Bible is the ultimate revealing reality, redeeming His creation, especially His image bearers, through His Son, Jesus Christ, by His Holy Spirit. And what we've been trying to do is every week launch from this and to, to locate maybe a particular word or two or idea in this statement that's going to be unfolded in a, in a more uh, specified way in this particular doctrine. And so I actually meant to highlight the word redeeming. So if you'll circle the word redeeming on your notes, one of the things we'll be looking at as we look at the at the doctrine of human sinfulness is we are in need of redemption. Sinners need to be redeemed. And so one of the things that we under, uh, uh, underscore in Christian theology is that our God is a redeeming God. Uh, is that good news to you? Why? Why is it good news that God's a redeeming God? Because that means you can be saved. That means you can be saved because what's your problem? You need a redemption. It's a room full of sinners. All right? Uh, and then there's a sinner standing up here uh, uh, teaching you tonight. And so we are sinners in need of redemption. So our God is a redeeming God. And then uh, uh, he, uh, God is not only redeeming us, but he's, he's, he's doing the, the work of redeeming all of creation, of putting the world to rights. And uh, among that, or central to that work, uh, is redeeming his image bearers. And so the reason I highlighted that in this definition is image bearing is a crucial aspect to a good definition for sin. One of the things that we run into in the doctrine of human sinfulness is the Bible talks about sin a great deal, and it talks about sin in all kinds of different dynamics. And so it's a little bit hard to boil down or, or, or get a single central concept of what sin is. But what I believe, and I'm going to lay out for you tonight, is when you when you when you bring sinfulness down to its fundamental essence, it is the failure and the rejection of, of, of God's design to be image bearers. It is saying no to that assignment. I won't be your image bearer. I won't live my life and I won't live in relationship with you as an image bearer. And so, well, and I'll, I'll lay this out a little bit more, that the, the most prominent Old Testament word for sin is chata, and the most prominent New Testament word for sin is hamartia. And both of those words, the Old Testament word and the New Testament word, mean to miss the mark. Have you ever heard of sin as missing the mark? They're archery terms. And, and it actually speaks of drawing back your bow, shooting the arrow, and missing the target. All right? And so the question is then, well, what is the target that we're missing? And I believe biblically, the, the, specifically, the mark that's being missed is the mark of being God's image bearers. It's the failure to be God's image bearers. And so I think uh, uh, Dr. Norman does a really good job of, of showing uh, and, and, and summing up how the doctrine of sin affects all the other doctrines. That's the other reason why systematic theology is so important because what you say about one doctrine needs to be collated with what you would say or teach about another. And so uh, what he says, and I'm just going to read it to you uh, on page 338 and 339. Uh, you just listen. I, I, I hate to just read it to you, but I thought this was so good I couldn't improve upon it. Dr. Norman writes, As is the case with most of our beliefs, the doctrine of sin is interrelated with the other theological tenets. For example, our view about the person and will of God will determine our understanding of sin. If God is a holy being who expects all human creatures to be as He is, then any deviation from His holy standard is sin. 
and the human condition is a matter of utmost seriousness. On the other hand, if God is imperfect or indulgent, a grandfatherly figure who may be unaware or indifferent to our activities, then, then the human condition is not a critical matter. In fact, such a God may himself be imperfect or sinful. The doctrine of humanity also intersects with our understanding of sin. If humans are creatures made in God's image, then they are made to reflect that image to God, others, and creation. People would be judged not in comparison with other people, but by their conformity to God's divine intentions and the manner in which they reflect His image. In addition, if human beings are created as free moral beings who are not determined by the forces of nature, then they're responsible for their actions and dispositions. Each individual would be culpable for any failure to measure up to God's standards. Any inability or unwillingness to achieve His intended purpose would be regarded as sin. Our doctrine of salvation is equally interrelated to our doctrine of sin. If human beings are essentially good and their spiritual, rational, emotional, and volitional capacities are whole and well, then any prospect of an infraction against God is unlikely. Any shortcomings they might experience would be due to intellectual limitations. Salvation in this scenario is overcoming ignorance by means of education. On the other hand, if human beings are sinfully corrupt as well as unable and unwilling to do what is right, then a radical transformation of their person is required. The more severe the problem of sin, the greater the need for supernatural salvific intervention of God. Our belief about sin also determines in large measure our view of the nature and purpose of the ministry of the church. If human beings are essentially good and capable of accomplishing what God requires, then the mission of the church is to exhort persons to achieve what is already in their ability to do. Appeals to kindness and compassion and generosity and charity would be sufficient to move people in the right direction. You know, that's what I do every Sunday. I just say, oh, y'all just go out there and be good. Is that, is that what I say? Is, would that work if that's what I did say? I wish we could just be good, but we're not. So if human beings are sinful, then our message is to proclaim the good news of salvation that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. In the case of the ministry of the church, would engage sinful humans with calls to repent of sin, place one's trust in Christ, and be born again. All right, y'all get the point of that? What we believe about one doctrine affects what we believe about all the other doctrines. And it's crucial that we keep them all integrated. All right? So, um, what does the Bible then say about human sinfulness? It really has these twin dynamics. Uh, when the Bible talks about sin, it speaks on one dynamic of the forces of destruction. Sin is a destructive power at work in the world. An overwhelming flood tide of rebellion against God that in a sense we're swept up in and, it's just, and it is destructive. This pulls in the idea of, of image-bearing God in making the world and, and bringing it to, to its created purpose uh, is what God is up to. And evil, sinfulness, works at cross-purposes purposes with that. God is building up the world and Satan is at work trying to destroy it. And so sinfulness uh, on, on one axis is the, is, are the forces of this destruction, this destructive rebellion against God. And then the other dynamic, when the Bible speaks about human sinfulness, it also speaks of our willing participation. The things about us that, that predispose us and guide us in our way that we sin. It talks about all the different attitudes and actions that we will employ in our own willful, willful participation uh, in rebellion against God. A good definition of it from the Bible is in Psalm 51 when David is confessing his, his sin uh, to the Lord when he uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, Psalm 51. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, just the first, first couple of verses. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. That's one word for sin. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. That's another word for sin. Cleanse me from my sin. That's another word uh, for uh, sin. Uh, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you and you only have I sinned and I've done what is evil. Another word for sin in your sight. You are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. That's a good compact view of, of both the forces of sin and also our willing participation. Who did David ultimately sin against? Against you. I did this against you. And I did it with a high hand. I did it knowing uh, that I was 
uh, choosing uh, to betray you, and I did it anyway. So some some uh, biblical concepts, and I didn't include all of the scripture verses, the scripture references, and I would encourage you to get this book if you don't have it, and utilize this because it's got a wealth of biblical references about all the different words that are in the Bible for, for sinfulness, but they, but they kind of gather up around some of these ideas. One is, the, or the main one, is missing the mark. I've already talked to you about that. Sin is missing the mark of being God's image bearers. Secondly, uh, the, the, the way that the Bible speaks of sin forces the forces of destruction of God's good world. We're trying to undo just as Satan is trying to undo what God has done in creating his good wor world. And so one of the words uh, for sin is depravity or being depraved. Uh, uh, the, and, and within this word group is the idea both of, of, of destruction that seems to be infecting and advancing. Have you ever noticed that when uh, you sin or when people sin, it kind of gets out of control? You ever had the experience of telling that little lie and it got away from you? Or starting that little habit and it got away from you? Y'all are sitting out there like you don't know what I'm talking about at all. Okay? Right? It just, it takes you further than, the, than you wanted to go, keeps you longer than you wanted to stay, and costs you more than you want to pay. That's this picture of the depravity of sin. It, it's the, um, I think I've told you the illustration before, the lady uh, the, uh, 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 got terribly bitten in, on the thigh by a polar bear at the zoo and you, you, you wonder, wow, that, that must have been bad, that bad polar bear. Well, it turns out the lady had to uh, get over about five different barriers to get up close because she wanted a real close-up picture of that polar bear. And that's really what sin does is it, it, it gets your attention and whispers to you and gives you some, uh, some good... Uh, um, counsel about how nice things would be if you would just indulge this a little bit and at the last moment when you're not looking it reaches through the bars and pulls you the rest of the way in. That's the idea of depravity. It's the advancing destruction and the shrink at the same time it involves the idea of the shrinking of, of good. The, 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 um, the things of, of righteousness are pushed to the margins as the, as the uh, activity of sinfulness broadens. The second idea of this force is wickedness. All right, so there's depravity and then there's wickedness and wickedness speaks of the ruination. Uh, not only does sin fan out and, and, and grow, but everything it touches, it ruins. It speaks of the staining, the permanent damaging effect of sin. The, uh, often the word for, for wicked can be translated evil. Uh, it is, um, the, the results are, it's a state of affairs that is opposite of the purposes of God. A third word is iniquitous, and iniquity means morally wrecked. Uh, it's, it speaks of as sin advances, and as sin infects things, it slowly robs the sinner of, of the ability to even know which way is up. Are you noticing that people seem to be less and less able to know even the fundamental truths of existence? Or is it, or is it just me? There's, there seems to be this catapulting, ever-increasing inability to know which way is up. And so the things that we tolerate, the things that we watch people uh, advocating, uh, are stunning that you wouldn't know that that's wrong. But that's this idea of iniquity that... Uh, that uh, we are searing our consciousness as with a hot iron. The, the, uh, 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 the next word is godless. Uh, the, the person who's moving through these different aspects of sin begins to reach a, a place where they want to really live as though God does not exist. Uh, the, uh, a, a, a famous atheist said one time, I know I can't really prove that God uh, doesn't exist, but I wish he didn't. I don't want him to. I want to, I, and here's what they say. Here's what they think they want. They want to live in a world where there is no God. But, but what do we know about a world where, where people live as though there is no God? Turns into a burning hellscape. That's, that's what you get. But that's, that's what people want. I want, to, uh, I want to have no authority over my life. 
uh, and uh, that godlessness begins to be a god. I, I, am, I am worshiping the, uh, the possible reality that no one will be telling me what to do. And then the final force is that of guilt. Uh, inevitably, um, there starts to be this recognition. I, can't, I cannot continue the way I'm going. The consequences are beginning to come my way. I deserve the punishment that's coming my way, and I can't do anything to extract myself. And so guilt uh, is, is a force. And let me tell you, as a pastor, guilt does horrible things to people. It does horrible things. It destroys people. So these are the forces that, that, that they're at work, the forces that we unleash when we rebel against God. And then there's terminology in the Bible that speaks of that subjective experience of joining in, of willfully participating in Satan's work to undo uh, God's good creation. Uh, one of the words, and kind of a main overarching word, is unrighteousness. Unrighteousness. Um, rejoicing in unrighteousness, uh, as, as Paul teaches about what, what real, real love really is, but uh, what love rejoices in the truth. And unrighteousness is a covenantal alignment with the principles of destruction. Unrighteousness is uh, almost a faith commitment to the opposite of God's will. And I've encountered people like that. They're, they are true believers. It's one of the things that I want us all to get better at. I'm, we tend to get trapped uh, in some conversations into, well, you religious people, y'all, just you're trying to impose your religion on us, and we irreligious people just want to you know, live our lives. Quit, quit buying that false dichotomy. Everyone is religious. Everyone believes uh, in, a, in a fundamental concept of how things work. And that's what a religion is. And for some people, or, and, and really for all sinners, the religion is unrighteousness, a covenantal commitment. The, the way I ought to live, the way all people ought to live is um, in, in, in rejection of God and God's purposes. Then this plays itself out. Uh, this decision to align oneself uh, with the principles of destruction. Uh, one is inattention, the refusal to listen. The refusal to listen. Uh, uh, that leads to error. And error, uh, the, the word group around error is just that wandering, prone to wander, a, a, a constant propensity to say, yeah, I, I, know, I know what the Bible says. I, I, know, I know what I've been taught. I, I know what, uh, what the wisdom of the past is. But I'm, gonna, I'm always going to want to rummage around in something else. A, a propensity to wander, uh, to put oneself in an environment uh, where uh, rejecting God is easy. Uh, uh, then ignorance. This is the refusal to know. Uh, the, the refusal to acknowledge the truth that, that's right there all uh, uh, around a person. And what starts to happen again is the force of sinfulness begins to darken the understanding. That's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1, that as we as we participate in this sinful rebellion against God, something starts to happen to our minds. And our foolish hearts are darkened. Our, we're darkened in our understanding. We, we begin to believe things that aren't true and reject things that are. That folds itself into lust. This becomes a longing to sin. Even when you're not sinning in a particular way, you're waiting for the opportunity to get to do so. It has a gravitational pull on your life. Uh, and that speaks of this, um, this uh, corruption of the conscience. This what lust speaks of addiction. Um, it speaks of a, of a, of a, a, a human who has let their flesh get so uh, corrupted that they, uh, uh, the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs, feet that rush to evil. People can't wait to the next opportunity uh, to do what's wrong. That leads to perversion, uh, the word group around perversion. Perversion just speaks of a twisting, twisting what is right. So not only loving to sin and enjoying it and wishing that other people would, would but uh, a, uh, now an allergy to what is good. Um, 
not being able to tolerate uh, the presence of things that are good. And one of the ways to, uh, to deal with that intolerance of what is good is to start calling what is good bad. Once again, I think, I, I think we're seeing this in our culture, is that, is that um, genuine arguments are being made that the real problem with our country is, are Christians. All these Christians are just ruining everything. That's a claim you really couldn't make legitimately to even 10 years ago. But now it's being, it's being proffered that the real problem with America is these religious people uh, and, and all of their... Um, closed-mindedness, and, uh, and even propensity for violence. Perversion leads to rebellion. This is just a revolt against God. This is the, uh, the active decision to, at every opportunity when one gets the sense that God wants them to do something, they're going to not do it on purpose. They're going to work uh, to rebel and revolt against anything having to do with God. Uh, 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 and the next term is transgression, that active departure. Uh, I knew it was wrong and I did it anyway. I knew it would hurt people and I did it anyway. I knew it would wreck this relationship and I did it anyway. I knew I would go to jail and I did it anyway. And we've, we've seen people and, and probably all of us can, can even point to times in our lives when we got so out of whack, it's, it, we, we started to, uh, it, it looked like transgression. And then treachery. This, is, this has the idea of, of, um, of, of betrayal, of trust, uh, an inability to have any kind of healthy relationship, uh, uh, an active working to hurt other people, and especially to hurt good people. And I think this is really where where sinfulness unleashed, a sinfulness that really begins to infect a person from top to bottom, they cannot tolerate the things of God anymore. And they put themselves in a... It, it, and it really, when you sum all of these things up, it just defines hell. It, it is what it must be like to be in hell. A life bereft of the things of God and the presence of God. And, as C.S. Lewis tells us, the, the, the reality of hell is not thy will, but my will be done. This is what life looks like when the commitment, the covenant commitment is, I will have what I want no matter what. There isn't any price I'm not willing to pay to have my way. Do you get a sense of the gravity? So it speaks of the forces of destruction and it speaks of willing participation in the destruction of God's good world, God's good purposes. And then we can pull this into the essence of the nature of sin. If it is refusing to be God's image bearers, refusing to participate with God in, the, uh, in his good purposes for the world, then what this looks like is um, uh, to, to, to engage in sin is to destroy what's good, to choose anything but God as the highest good, that's idolatry. Uh, uh, to put the self at the center, that's pride. I think, it, again, it was C.S. Lewis that said, if you want to really sum up sin, it's pride. Um, I, I want what I want, and I want to be at the center of all things. Indulging in what is destructive. Not only uh, willing to participate in the destruction of good things, but a, um, a growing cultivation of such uh, destructive impulses. I want more of what God doesn't uh, and, what, and what God isn't. Rejecting uh, God is the highest, so that's idolatry, unbelief, uh, and rebellion. So that kind of sums up what the Bible has to say about sin. And then what does the church believe? So that when, as we're constructing systematic theology, step one is what does the Bible say? Step two is what does the church believe? And so what the church has been contending with, uh, obviously there's been a lot of thinking about the different aspects of sin, but, but for our purposes, since I don't have nine hours to, uh, to beat y'all up with my uh, theolo theological nerditude, we'll, we'll stick with one of the main uh, discussion points, which is what is the source of sin? Uh, in our lives, what makes us sinful, 
And what is our connection to the sin of Adam uh, as Adam and Eve introduced sinfulness into the world? What is, what's the, what, how does Adam's sin actually affect us? And that's what the church has been contending with across the years. And so during the Protestant period, that's the uh, couple hundred years after the close of the New Testament, uh, there was a really a movement from uh, the belief that Adam's sin influences us. We are born into a world that's broken and predisposed towards sin. But ultimately, humans are responsible. Even though we live in a broken world and even though we're related to Adam, the, the reason you're a sinner is because you knowingly uh, do what God has told you not to do, even when you could have done otherwise. That's where things were at the beginning of the patristic period, but by the end, there was the development of the idea of inherited guilt. And that becomes really the big idea in theology for the next several hundred years. That not only are we living in the world and that Adam gave us, and living in the world that Adam's sin knocked out of order, but we are actually guilty of Adam's sin. And when God looks at us, uh, he, he, um, uh, uh, he imputes the sin of Adam to us so that we're guilty because Adam sinned. Okay? And that's really Augustine uh, uh, really um, developed that idea that Adam's sin made us guilty. Okay? So then in the medieval period, that moved from Augustine to Aquinas. Um, Aquinas continued to develop this idea of original sin. And that, have y'all heard the term original sin before? That really comes out of the Catholic tradition, first of all. And original sin means that Adam's sin caused the rest of us to be guilty. And so our problem is that we need our original sin removed. And the only, way, uh, in, uh, it, uh, the only way anyone can be saved is that original sin uh, has to be uh, removed. And all people are born not only sinful but guilty. So even babies, when they're born, they're already not just predisposed towards sinfulness, but they're actually guilty. In the Roman Catholic tradition, what is the way to get rid of the original sin of an infant? It baptized the infant. So it's called baptismal regeneration. And so when you baptize an infant, it washes away original sin. And that was really, it started with Augustine, but it really gets dialed in during the medieval period with Aquinas. And so that, that and so I mentioned the sacraments, uh, the, the sacrament of, of, uh, of, of infant baptism wipes away original sin. So in the Catholic tradition, what grew, what's grown out of that are things like purgatory, things like... Um, um, limbo. Uh, what happens to babies who die without being baptized? Well, they go, they're in limbo. Okay? They, can't, they can't be rightly related to God in heaven because their original sin was not, uh, was, was not dealt with. Okay? So, in the Reformation, uh, Martin Luther and later John Calvin take uh, Augustine uh, to his logical conclusion. If all human beings are born guilty, born damned, uh, and not all human beings get saved, then we've got to fold in a doctrine of election. So what it is is that since everyone's basically born dead, God chooses to select some of them to be brought back to life. And he regenerates them. He gives them the gift of faith. They're able to respond to the gospel if they hear it and they get saved and they can't do otherwise. But all that's because everybody is born dead, born spiritually dead, unable to respond uh, to anything having to do with God, unable to do any good at all. Even human beings' uh, acts that look like they might be good really are evil. And so only those that God uh, elects uh, are those that can uh, ever respond uh, to anything uh, 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 having to do with God and certainly the only ones who can respond uh, to, the, to the offer of salvation. All right, here's how they get there. Now look, I want y'all to kind of get your blood flowing here because this, this is an important aspect of what's been going on in theology for the last several hundred years, but it's a little, it can be a little uh, abstruse. 
So, uh, but I'm, I'm going to try to I'm trying to make it clear as I can. All right. So uh, you, you see their natural headship. What Augustine, the way Augustine made his case that all human beings are born spiritually dead is through something he calls natural headship. Adam is the natural head of all of humanity. All humanity flows out of him uh, and is, is really physically or naturally by nature connected to Adam genetically. And so that guilt is actually passed genetically from human being to human being to human being. And so because Adam sinned, and we were in Adam when Adam sinned because we were in his, in his body genetically. And then all of us are born with the same guilt that Adam received when he sinned against God. Natural headship. Okay, That has some problems to it. And so that translated in the, in the Reformation period from natural headship to federal headship. And what, uh, what especially John Calvin and others proposed is that Adam is the covenantal head of all human beings. There was a series of covenants that God made with Adam, and Adam's ability to keep them would have resulted in one thing. Adam's failure to keep them would have resulted in another thing. So the first covenant was a covenant of works. By the way, why it's called federal? Because you may think federal, like the federal government. Uh, Adam was an American. You know, that's not... Uh, uh, fotis means covenant, Okay. Uh, it comes from the word fidelity or, or a faithful relationship. And so it's called federal headship. Just, just think the word covenant. So Adam is our covenant head. So God makes a, an, an, an agreement, a covenant with Adam called the covenant of works in the garden. And the covenant of works is a, is a temporary time of testing. And if Adam can obey God without fail for a certain period of time, then God will impute Adam's righteousness to the rest of humanity. If Adam had not failed, if Adam had passed the test, we all would have just been, Adam's righteousness would have been imputed to the rest of us, and, and the, whole, the whole scenario would have, been, would have been great. But because Adam failed in that covenant of works, Adam's unrighteousness, his guilt was imputed to all of the rest of us. And so then there was a covenant of redemption, and the covenant, I'm sorry, the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace was uh, that God would, would, would make a way to save sinners. All right? And then the covenant of redemption was God's decision to save sinners by sending Jesus uh, to undo the sin of Adam. And that part of that covenant of redemption, he was only going to redeem the elect. And so he decided in eternity past, these are the number of people that I'm going to, um, I'm going to redeem. And that's it. And that's how that's going to work. I'm going to, I'm going to choose to save some. And I've decided in advance who they are. And so everyone else is going to be born dead. And those who are not elect will just stay dead. And then when, they, then when judgment falls, then those are the people that will go to hell. And, and the elect will go to heaven. All right, so that's, that's how federal headship plays itself out. All right? And so you see there that I have the T of tulip. Raise your hand if you know what I mean when I say the, uh, the, the, the five points of Calvinism are tulip. Okay, all right, thank you. This just gives me a little, a, a little gauge. Okay. Hmm because I don't think I have enough time to do that. I was going to do that in the Doctrine of Salvation. Well, one of the things that federal headship uh, uh, espouses is something called total depravity. Total depravity. And what total depravity, again, means is that because of Adam's sin, human beings are born without the capacity to respond to God at all. They're born without the capacity, even if they hear the gospel, it, with total depravity, prevents you from being able to say yes to God. The only way that the totally depraved people can say yes to God, if God chooses them, and then those he's chosen, he regenerates them, which means he brings them back to life, and then he gives them the gift of faith so that they're able to exercise faith, and then they exercise faith, 
and they, uh, they're justified and uh, adopted and sanctified and uh, all of those things that the New Testament talks about, about what it means to get saved, all of that starts to click forward. But that's completely based on the decision of God. And he does it for some, and he doesn't do it for everybody else. And that whole system of salvation is, is rooted in this idea of original sin. So let me stop there. Have I left everyone behind? Do you have questions at this stage of the game? Yes. Um, are you going to define whether or not you are Calvinistic or are you not? Yeah, that's great. I'm not. And, uh, and so let me... Uh, let me lay that out. So in the Reformation era, towards the end of the Reformation era, um, a guy named Jacob Arminius began, be, began to question some of these ideas about predestination and election and all of that. And so Arminianism uh, is a view that would, that uh, uh, that's what um, Methodists, Method, John Wesley and the Methodists um, uh, have a, a view that uh, is... Um, uh, that criticizes and critiques some of these views of Reformed theology. How that shows up... Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was say, um, Jesus was 100% man, 100% God. How do Calvinists... Like, wouldn't that apply that Jesus was... Very good. Original sin in Jesus. That's a great question. That's another big old uh, issue is did Jesus have a sin nature? And so the, the, the uh, universal response of the church, and, and this is the orthodox use, that Jesus did not have a sin nature. And that's what the whole being born of a virgin uh, is. is, a, is um, uh, Jesus' virgin birth is a part of the way in which Jesus did not inherit a sin nature. Um, uh, I kind of go with Miller Erickson. I don't think you have to connect those two things. I think... If God just decides he's going to incarnate Jesus without a sin nature, God, God can do that. He, and, uh, and Jesus would still participate uh, in, in an existence uh, much like Adam did, still subject to sin, still subject to error, uh, and um, uh, having to make real decisions between right and wrong. I don't think Jesus, I don't think the fix was in. If the fix is in, then Jesus is not, it's, it's, it's just more of a, Play acting. It's not a. It's not a real uh, battle between good and evil that, that Jesus is uh, is living out in his incarnation. Does that does that kind of answer your question? Okay. Um, all right. So, in what I'm coming to realize is I'm I've got 200 things to explain to make all this make sense, uh, and I'm, I'll probably have to do some of this next week. So let me let me try to. Uh, uh, simply sort of give us a place to stand for a second um, as we try to think about uh, um, what the Baptist view and really what my view of original sin is. You know what, well, I'll just keep going and we'll see how it all works out. So, uh, no, it was, because it's a good question. And let me go ahead and say now, I'm, I am not reformed in my, in my understanding and I would say that while there is a strong uh, Calvinistic and reformed uh, aspect to Southern Baptist life. It's a, it's a vibrant uh, element of our theological tradition, and there are many Calvinistic or Calvinist Southern Baptists. There's also a stream that's not Calvinist, all right, that would uh, very much reject the idea uh, that God saves some and chooses others without any reference to their response of faith. Okay, and those two, for, for, for Baptists, those two traditions have kind of run along and they, they kind of bounce into each other and they've, uh, one, one will kind of become ascendant and then, it'll, and then the other one will and they've kind of flowed along together uh, all throughout Baptist history. Uh, but for me, while I have an appreciation for, for Calvinism's seriousness about sin and the depth of our need, if Jesus doesn't save us, we can't get saved. Uh, we, we are, we're in horrible shape. Uh, uh, sin makes us so spiritually sick. We are helpless and hopeless. But the offer of salvation still, still requires a response of faith. 
And a response of faith that's real requires the ability to reject it. So there's that. And then also, I think the universal love of God for all sinners is so clear in Scripture that to say that God just chooses some and not others, I think it really makes affirming uh, John 3.16 very, very difficult. John 3.16 says what? For God so loved the world. Okay? Not some people in the world, not some of the world, the world. Uh, 1 John 4, uh, Christ died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. See, I just think that's a killer text for this uh, hard, what I would call double, predest double predestination, that God chooses some and not others, and that's it. So the, the, the Bible is, is crystal clear about God's desire for everyone to be saved. And also crystal clear, will everyone be saved? No. Why will everyone not be saved? Because they say no to the gospel or because they never hear the gospel. All right? So, um, but let me keep rolling along here. So in the modern period then, what, as, as, and, and modern Protestant Christian theology sort of split into liberalism and conservatism uh, in, uh, in the uh, era, starting really from the mid-1800s up to the present. And in the liberal tradition, it, the, the idea was sin is really um, can be overcome by effort. We just need more education. Uh, we, you know, people need better therapy. Uh, they need better systems. If they had better institutions, people would just get better and better and better. And eventually we'll, we'll be able to, um, we, uh, we can follow Jesus' example and sort of on our own, we can just, we can deal with the sin problem. And that, that tends to be the liberal uh, trajectory. And at the same time, and we'll, hopefully we'll get to this and talk about it a little bit more, also the idea that sin is not really a good way to talk about the problem. Sin is not our problem. Uh, it's really just ignorance or bad ideas or we haven't, haven't had our, our inventions aren't good enough or we talk about sin too much. That's the problem with the world is we just spend too much time telling people they're sinners and if we just quit telling people that and let people just be whoever they wanted to be then everyone will be happy. Hey, that, I think none of it is society. We just change Yes. Yes. Very, very much, and, and that's, a, that's a great insight because what, so you have, a, you have the individual dynamic of sin, and that's just my choices to not do what God's told me to do. But there is a corporate element of sin. When you, when you get sinners together, uh, sin has a, a larger effect, so like the sin of racism. That's, that's real, that, that, that's not, that, that's real. And so in theological traditions, one aspect of sin can be um, um, lifted up over the other. Sometimes, frankly, in our tradition, our emphasis is too much on individual sin without any regard to, uh, to uh, larger forces of sin around us. In the liberal tradition, it's the opposite. Let's not worry about individual sin. Individuals can just do whatever they want. The real problem is society. If we can fix society, um, that's, that's where we need to start. But I think on balance, what does the Bible say about the real root of sin in the world? Where is sin in the world rooted? In the heart of men. Alexander Solzhenitsyn says, the line between good and evil doesn't run between my group and your group. The line between good and evil runs right down the center of every human heart. And so sin does have a corporate dimension, but sin is rooted in the individual rebellion against God. So, uh, in, in, the, in the modern period, um, uh, uh, liberalism, I've, I've gone over that, and then within conservatism, it's been this discussion mainly over uh, is Reformed theology right, or how, if, if Reformed theology is wrong, where is it wrong? And what's the nature of original sin? And, and we're going to talk about that as we, as we move forward. So how does, how does it all fit together then? Um, first of all, uh, a good definition of sin, again, is the re rejection of God and His purposes for His image bearers. It's saying no to God and it's saying no to what God wants to do. Uh, it's living without reference to, uh, uh, to God. And, uh, oh, here's what I mean. 
there is no way to have a discussion about sinfulness if you can't have a discussion about God. And so, in order to speak of sinfulness, we have to speak of God. Why, why do you need to be able to speak of God if you're going to be able to speak about sin? Because God's holy? Why else? There has to be absolute truth. That's right. There has to be a standard giver. And that standard has to have an, have an ultimate reference. And that ultimate reference stands outside of us. And so, uh, if there is no ultimate truth, then there is no sin. Instead, what are people doing? Instead of there being ultimate truth and there being sin, what, what do we have if there is no ultimate truth? No well, what is, and then what does that mean for human behavior? Just do whatever you want. And see, that's really another problem with atheism. Uh, there's really no way to live that out. It, on atheism, what is the moral imperative? Just do it, be true to thyself. Do whatever you want. Now you can make a little proviso in there, do whatever you want, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. But the atheist gives up the game at that point. Because the question is, why? Why would you not want to, uh, why would you not do something that you want to do if it hurts someone else? If there is no God. I say, if there is no God, eat, drink, and be, do whatever you want. And if it hurts someone else, who cares? You should care as much about hurting some, some other human being as you would about hurting the roach that you smash or the, or the, the bug that, that splats on your windshield. You see how radical the demand of atheism is? And it's met by the radical demand of Christian theology, which is if there is a God. See, here's the deal. If there is a God, then what? What does that mean for human morality? If there is a God, there is an absolute. then there is an absolute. And if there is an absolute, then what does that mean? What does that mean for us? You have to obey or face the consequences. You have to obey or you, or you fall into the hands of the one who sets the standards. Those are your options. And, but what do, what, do, what do human beings want? We want to have our cake and eat it too. We want, a, we want a buffet style morality and we want people to follow the rules that we like and follow the rules that, that, that put us in a, in a, in a you know, that give us what we want. But we really don't want to press into a, a collision with the one true and living God who hasn't made us for happiness or for having what we want. What has God made us for? Back to my definition for sin. Bear his image in the world, be co-creators with him, and bring his kingdom in, into the world, and bring the bring the glory of God over all the all the world. I'll get to this at, at another point, but I've, I've just been overwhelmed afresh by Romans eight, where, where where Paul says all creation groans, awaiting for the revelation of the sons of God. Where the the world is broken because of sin, and human beings have the responsibility to. To show forth the glory of God in the world, we've refused to do that. And the result of that is everything groans. And Paul says, and, and we do too, we inwardly we're groaning as well. So, uh, uh, this sin refers both to the content of, of the moral demand and the results. It refers to the disposition of sin. That means just the attitude of sinfulness and to the deeds. Uh, sin is universal. Uh, everyone but Jesus, and I make that proviso in my notes, everyone but Jesus sins. Everybody. Nobody uh, uh, is able to live and not sin. Even really, really good people. It's what I love about the Bible. Boy, that King David sure was a great guy, wasn't he? <clears throat> nope. Boy, old Abraham, he just always did everything exactly right. <laughs> nah, he's a liar. And a, and a lot of other things. Scoundrel. And so the Bible tells this story that there's no one righteous, not even one. No one's good. That's the message of, of Romans 1. And so then uh, also uh, sin asserts its profundity. Number one, every dimension of existence is touched by sin. Every dimension of existence, everything inside of you, psychologically, morally, emotionally, uh, relationally, uh, physically, all of it is, is corrupted by sin. And then everything outside of you, um, in, in your marriage, in your families, society, culture, institutions, schools, states, governments, it's all 
uh, corrupted and broken by sin. It's profound. And secondly, uh, it's so profound, no human being is able to extricate himself or herself from it. We are trapped and we can't get out. It's a prison of our own making and we locked ourselves in and we chucked the key out and we cannot get ourselves out. That's what, that's, <laughs> that's what sin is and that's a doctrine of sin. And so how, for, how do, then does original sin, this whole discussion of original sin, uh, fit into this? Are we born sinful or are we born guilty? Because if all, would you agree that other than Jesus, all human beings sin? Yes, all right. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the question is, why do we sin because we're sinners or are we sinners because we sin? What is the sound of one hand clapping? Uh, no, uh, uh, but, but that's the question. If everyone sins, why? Can, are, are we unable, incapable, hardwired for sinfulness? Or is it the case that we simply uh, are disposed towards it and at the first opportunity when given the choice that's what we choose to do is it, is it the result of our choice or is it the result of a of a of a God ordained God allowed state of affairs in which uh, we can do no nothing other than sin be, uh, so are we born sinful are we born guilty are we born unable to do what is right or are we born inclined to do what is wrong uh, is sin imparted that idea of imparted is that yes we're in we're born into this sinful world in this sinful body and we're predisposed and we lean towards sinfulness or is it imputed that God says you're guilty uh, and and condemned because of Adam's sin and there's nothing you can do about it okay uh, so on the born guilty view, this would be the reformed view. That, that, uh, this is the federal headship view that's rooted in the natural headship view. Um, um, it flows out of this idea. Do you see that F ho and in quo? Here's a little, here's a little historical theology for you as, uh, as well. The, the idea that we sinned in Adam uh, is, uh, is a mistake that Augustine made. Uh, in, in his translation, he couldn't read Greek, so he was reading the Latin translation of the New Testament, and he misunderstood Romans 5.12 uh, uh, and came away understanding that that verse was saying that in Adam we all sinned. In Adam we all sinned. And so he developed this idea that, that Adam's sin was imputed uh, to, to the rest of us. And so the reformers, Calvin and Luther... Uh, made a little correction. That's why they moved things from natural headship to federal headship. This view that um, um, all human beings are born dead and a select few are, are chosen uh, to be saved. That's the born guilty view. The born sinful view. This is my view. Okay. This, I think, is the view of most Southern Baptists. Uh, this... Uh, 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 but it comes in several forms, all right? Well, the first form is, is, uh, was Pelagianism. Uh, this is an old heresy from back during the days of Augustine. And what Pelagius said is that human beings are capable of initiating their own salvation and they're capable of becoming sinless if they just try hard enough. Sound good? Ah, no, nope, wrong. It was declared a heresy. And really, we don't even have any of the things Pelagius wrote because they burned all of his books and... I think they exiled him somewhere and, and that sort of thing. But that's that, the view that you can do it on your own. While this is a heretical view theologically, I think it's the common view of most people. Uh, especially people that really don't have much to do with church and uh, don't have really any biblical understanding. What, what do they think gets them saved? What, do, what does an ordinary, uh, uninitiated person think about how to go to heaven? And, and kind of what, what are some of the things they'll say? Been a good person. I help people. Grandma went to church. Uh, I never remember. I keep the Ten Commandments, or I keep eight of the Ten Commandments, or whatever it is. Right? That's just that's just the old heresy of Pelagianism. I can do it on my own. Uh, I'm a pretty good person. I'm getting better and better all the time. Um. And, and, what, and, and I, keep, I had that in the born sinful because Pelagius would say, yeah, we've got, you know, we kind of start off 
sort of lumpy, but you, you'll just get better and better as you go along, as you just uh, try harder and harder and harder. So uh, Pelagian. Uh, and then Wesleyan, this is, the, this is in the uh, Methodist tradition. What John Wesley didn't really like the reform view. He didn't like this idea that God has just decided some are in and some are out and that's it. But, the, but Wesley couldn't get away from the idea of federal headship. And so uh, he did believe that we all have Adam's guilt imputed to us. Everyone is born guilty. But what John Wesley introduced is the idea of prevenient grace. And what he says is when Jesus died on the cross, original sin, that original guilt was removed from everybody. And so now all human beings are, are born without the effects of original sin. Now what's the problem with that? What, what, what do you see as a, maybe a problem with that view? Do what? Well, you got, yeah, you got the whole, what, what happened to people in the Old Testament. Very good. And, and, and truth be told, there's really not any evidence for pervenient grace working that way uh, in the New Testament. It's just a, it's like a, it's like a theological fix to try to correct something that, that was wrong in the first place. All right? But that, that's the Wesleyan view, and it's still the, still the view. Uh, it had to start someplace. That's right. And so, and so let me get to then to, to what would be maybe the Baptist view or my view or I'm going to call it the Southern Baptist view. The reason I call this the Southern Baptist view is because what the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 says is that human beings inherit a nature and an environment inclined towards sin. That's what the Baptist Faith and Message says. We inherit a nature and an environment inclined towards sin. So it's a very specific uh, articulation that we don't uh, uh, inherit um, Adam's sin uh, and we don't inherit Adam's condemnation. So wh what that means is, is that, and here's what Miller Erickson, a really good Baptist theologian says, is that sin is not necessary, but it's inevitable for all. It's not necessary that anyone sins, but because we're born with a nature and environment that's inclined towards evil, we will, we, it's not necessary that we act upon that sin, but it's inevitable that we will. And that our sin nature and our sinful environment is, is sufficient to explain the universal sinfulness of human beings. We're just, we're just bent that way. But the reason that we sin is because we choose to do so, not because God withholds the ability for us to do what's good. Okay, so with all this then, so a couple of other uh, issues that come up are the fate of infants and the age of accountability. Uh, if we're, and so if we are born with the propensity to sin, but we, we're not guilty until we actually sin, when, at what age are we responsible uh, and are going to be held accountable uh, for, uh, for the sins we commit? And what about infants who die in infancy? What, is, uh, what does God do uh, with these infants who are born with a sin nature? Okay, so let's take up the idea of the age first. And we can't say in the Bible, age matters. All right, in the spies, remember, remember the, uh, the, the, the spies, 12 spies go and they spy out the land and the people rebel. What's the consequence? The adult's going to enter into land again. That's right. Everybody 20 and under can go in. But everybody 20 and above is, is regarded as, as sinning against the Lord. And the, the, a reasonable inference is it was those who were young, who were young and not responsible uh, uh, at that point. Uh, David's son, remember David's son that dies the, the, uh, as a result of his, of his uh, sin with Bathsheba? What does David say about that son? You'll see him again. I'll see him again. So David seems to know. Uh, that, there is a, uh, that there's an eternal destiny. And I think David's expectation was uh, a destiny with, uh, uh, with the Lord. Uh, Jonah, remember from the book of Jonah? The very end, um, uh, God makes a distinction about, uh, Jonah, why are you not happy that this city wasn't destroyed? It's even filled with, with children that don't even know their right hand from their left hand and would have been swept up in all of this. And so God's recognizing that, that, the, that 
um, age matters. And in Ezra 18 uh, really just lays out very clearly an Old Testament articulation that you're responsible for your own sin. You're not responsible for the sins of your parents uh, or what your parents do is not going to be held against you. And so the idea of age has to do with the idea of responsibility and the idea of responsibility has to do with capacity to repent. If someone is going to get saved, uh, they need to be able to repent. Uh, if they are going to repent, they need to be able to understand the difference between right and wrong. They need to be morally responsible. And to be morally responsible, they need to be old enough and babies don't have such a capacity. So what, what I believe is that babies, if they die in infancy because they have not um, sinned, then they don't stand in wrong relationship with God and so God welcomes them uh, as, a, uh, as, a, um, as, a, as a result of the fact that God doesn't punish the guiltless. When it comes to emphasis, you flip it, you can, uh, on the back side, um, I have something called Erickson's Solution. So Millard Erickson is a Baptist theologian, and he tends to be a little bit more Calvinistic. And so here's how he squares. He believes that, that infants actually inherit guilt. But here's how... He squares that with the fact that infants, some infants don't die and go to hell because they just weren't chosen. And so what Erickson says is that the imputation of sinfulness has to be actually ratified by someone's actual sin before Adam's sin is imputed to them. Does that make sense to you? Okay, I'll try. It didn't barely make sense to me now that I say it aloud. So, Erickson wants to affirm this, this old and long-held belief that Adam's sin is actually credited to all human beings. But he also doesn't like the idea, because here's what that demands. On the Reformed view, there are some babies that die and go to hell. In fact, most babies die and go to hell. Because they weren't chosen. And people find that problematic. Okay? Uh, it, doesn't, it, it strikes me as being unjust. Uh, it strikes me as not befitting the God we read about in the Bible. Uh, and, uh, it, uh, and then I find as a pastor uh, that it's, it's utterly pastorally impossible. Um, uh, Dr. Henry's here, and, and I haven't had this discussion with him specifically, but I know, I, I would guess that he has had the, the difficult task. I have a couple, on a couple of occasions of, of uh, dealing with someone who's been through a stillbirth. And uh, you talk about heartbreaking tragedy of a magnitude that can barely be surpassed. It's, it's, it is, it's just as bad as you think it is. And folks like Jerry and I are called to go minister the love of Christ in, in, into those situations. Now I will tell you, the times I've walked into a delivery room, and it's that situation, and that little mother looks up at me, what does she want to know? Well, that, 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 really, that's not what she wants to know. What does she really want to know? Where's my baby? Am I going to be my, my, with my baby again? That's what, the, that's what the mom wants to know. Yeah, that's right. And so they want to know why. Certainly that's all in there. But when the question, will I see my baby again? It was really part of David's question. Do you really think I'm going to, I'm going to say, I don't know. Depends on if the baby was elect or not. I, no way. I'm not doing that to that person, and I don't believe that. And, and, I, and I don't believe that the God we find in the Scriptures is like that. And so it's, that's how theology plays itself out in real time and in, and in real ministry. And so... Um, so Erickson doesn't want to say that either. And most Baptist theologians, uh, even um, here's the way Albert Moeller gets around it. He's a five-point Calvinist that is our president of Southern Seminary. And he got asked about the fate of infants. And he doesn't want to get put down as saying that some infants go to hell. And so what he says is all infants who die in infancy are elect. Well, that's pretty convenient, you know. <laughs> And it's, it's just sort of backing your way up into an answer because what he knows is, and, and here's really, because Dr. Muller's not a, he's a smart guy, 
is he knows that it would not be, be befitting of God's character for any unborn, un, for any infant uh, who dies in infancy to be sent to hell. And so he just says, God makes an arrangement where all those are, um, uh, uh, all those are elect. I just think that's special pleading. And so Erickson's attempt to get around it is to say the Adam's sin is not imputed to a person when they come into existence, when they're conceived. Adam's sin is actually only imputed to them when they actually sin themselves, when they ratify it with their own behavior. Then it gets imputed. Now, I think that's a nifty uh, approach to getting around it. I just, I just don't know why you don't fix the original problem, which is God doesn't do that. God doesn't impute sin to everybody and then only save some. That's just not how, that's, 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 I don't believe that's how God works. And so I got there, Hankins' solution. So you see that on your note, the Hankins' solution is, since there's no inherited guilt, God does not impute Adam's guilt to us. There's no problem for God to welcome uh, infants who, who um, die. Um, it's, not, it's no problem for him to, him to welcome them into heaven. Okay? So, uh, then with the time we have left, real quickly, the, as we think about how all this fits together, we also want to have a word about the consequences of sin. Uh, now that we know that... that uh, in, oh, yes, sir? I haven't heard you mention human nature. And, and tell me what you mean. Expand that for me a little bit. We talk about we uh, are sinful because of our human nature. And as the New Testament speaks of the old man and the regenerated man. Yes. Um, I got you. Very good. Yes. There is a... Um, so let me see if I can give a, a, a somewhat... Let me see if I can answer the question you're asking specifically. Sin has indeed affected and infected every aspect of human existence. And so we do have this, uh, this tilt and this corruption towards sinfulness. Uh, yet when we hear the gospel, we have the opportunity to say yes and a, a, the ages turn. And so there's a sense in which on a very, very individual level, the ult God's ultimate plan for all of history starts to take place. The old passes away. Just like one day the old world will pass away and the new world will come, right? Don't you believe that? Well, that happens on a cosmic level. Well, you're a tiny picture of that, each one of you who say yes to Jesus. And as soon as you say yes to Jesus, a process starts. And the old begins to pass away. And the new starts to displace it. But... In between being justified and being glorified, we're in the sanctification process. And that old man, he's, uh, he's critically wounded but not completely dead yet. And so he's rummaging around in your life, oh, making noise and pulling on stuff and that sort of thing. But he's weak. He's dying. He's, um, uh, he's insufficient anymore to dominate your life. And of course, the more you're obedient to the to the, the voice and the spirit of Jesus, the more uh, the, the the less and less and less authority and impact that old man uh, has over your life. Now, the old man isn't completely done away with until we we go to glory at death or until Jesus comes again. But there is uh, there is and ought to be uh, a um, a temporal progression. Uh, of, of increasing um, life and, and dominance of, the new, of your new creation side and a diminishment uh, of, that, of that old rebellious man. Is that, am I kind of getting at what you're asking me, Larry? Uh, yeah. Right, right. And so uh, it doesn't mean that, you get, I think we all would love to believe we would just get saved and all of our problems and all of our own personal problems go away, but that's not the, that's not the process. It just always seems to be a continuous battle. There's a continuous battle. That's right. That's right. We, um, and it's said, and this is a, uh, a, a good way to describe, because Paul talks about this a lot. Why do I do what I don't want to do? And I don't do what I, you know, there's this, there's this bad, and thanks be to, uh, thanks, uh, to Jesus who sets me free and gives me the victory. Uh, we live between the times. And Paul lived in this tension between the old passing away and the new coming. And we, uh, we, just, we just live between those times. It's a good, it's a good insight. All right, so the, the consequences of sin. What does sin do? And we've traveled over these things, so I'll, I'll go through it very quickly. First of all, it ruins our relationship with God. 
And the way that looks is wrath. That means God is against us. Have you ever come to recognize that because of your rebellion, you had made yourself an enemy of God? But that's what happens. And it's not because God's this mean guy. It's because He's a righteous and holy God. And when we put ourselves at cross purposes with His will, we actually put ourselves at cross purposes with Him because He's a relational God. And so what happens in our relationship with Him is what happens in any relationship when one person wounds and offends and abuses the other person. There's, a, there's a, a wall of hostility that builds up. God's against us. And in enmity, we're against God. We don't want Him telling us what to do. We don't want Him involved in our lives. And we're hostile to the things that have to do with Him. And then guilt, this growing awareness of deserved punishment. It, it's growing. A guilt tends to just get worse and worse and worse until it, until it, it uh, uh, leeches every good thing out of our lives. Ruin relationship with God, ruin relationship with others. It's the same as with God. It's an ever worsening, worsening mutual hostility. When, when Paul talks about the deeds of the flesh in the uh, book of Galatians, it's mainly malice and, and jealousy and envy and strife. Your relationships do not work. And why don't your relationships work when sin has infected you? What are some of the other things we talked about? What are, what are some of the... Um, Attitudes of sinfulness that make human relationships not work. So, have you ever noticed that selfishness is a problem in your relationships? Yeah. When you think about yourself first and what you want, I'm going to have my way. And as soon as uh, I do this to Janet, more than I would like to admit, well, as soon as she starts to act right, I'll start to act right. Right? That's not how it works. And that's not how Jesus treated us. And that's not what the, what the Bible says. But my selfishness worsens, uh, worsens the state of affairs. So ruined relationship with others. Ruined image bearing. Even, even our, what I really wanted to say is that our relationship with ourselves. Even on the inside of us, we're enslaved. So we, so we can't stop doing what's wrong anymore. We're, we become slaves. Uh, the powers, uh, the power of sin has o overtakes our lives. We're enslaved, we're deceived. This speaks of that, what's called a noetic aspect of sin. We no longer think correctly. When you, want, when you have had to go through the painful process of walking with a good friend or loved one who's really gotten messed up, they're, they're, they're addicted or they've just made decision after decision that's selfish, have, have you ever had to just step back and wonder at how twisted their thinking becomes? what they'll believe, their solutions to problems, what they'll, what they'll get involved in, what they'll try, what they'll stoop to. It becomes, and, and to them, it just makes as much sense as you, as you could possibly imagine. But it's really just uh, a, uh, an envelopment of deception uh, and lies in the ability to see the truth. And then uh, curved in on the self. Uh, an inability to see anything from anybody else's perspective. It's all about you all the time. And then ruined relationship with the world. As I said, all creation groans. Sin just, it just, we, we, you, you, it, you, you let it loose and it's a, it's a, it's a whirlwind, it's a hurricane that just destroys and keeps on going. It's historical. It just, it's, uh, uh, you watch often the effects of sin in family relationships. So it's just generational. And, and so the, it, when we sin, every, all of God's good creation is affected by it. And so why does it matter today? As I come to a conclusion. Um, why does having a good doctrine of sinfulness matter today? First of all, because Western culture has rejected the idea of sin. If you go to work tomorrow and say, Hey, does anybody want to talk about sin? You know, what kind of reaction are you going to get? We, uh, sin is this churchy word that religious people use, and they go around shaking their finger at everybody else and trying to tell everybody else how to live. And if we could just get rid of the idea of sin and quit calling things sin and quit calling certain behaviors sin, and especially that it has to do with sexuality, now there's nothing sinful uh, that has to do with any kind of, of a sexual urge that anybody wants to in indulge in. All of that is actually good. That's actually good. Did you know when I was, and I'm going to tell a story on Ole Miss and Oxford. I'll just stay away from the Alabama schools. 
but I'll tell you it's going on at your Alabama schools. When I was there, I heard the story, had a meeting of all the sororities. All the sororities were, were all the gals were invited to, to a conference at the beginning of a new semester. And uh, two ladies uh, came to, to, uh, to set them straight, uh, especially with respect to, to sexuality. And here's what they said. We know this room is filled with these evangelical Christians with your closed-minded view of sex, this idea that marriage is a, between a man and a woman for life. And that's the proper context for sex. We want y'all to know that's completely wrong. And that what you need to do over your next four years here at Ole Miss is to have as many and as varied sexual experiences as possible. And if you really want to be free and enlightened and healthy and happy, what you need to do is you need to have as many and as varied experiences as you can fit in. That's not UC Berkeley. That's not some liberal bastion in the, in the Northeast. That's the University of Mississippi. And that's the view. Let's just get rid of the idea of sin and then we'll get rid of the idea of guilt and we'll get, we won't be repressed. It's a very Freudian idea. Freud believed is we, if we can get rid of people repressing anything, that's where all of this dysfunction and, and uh, um, uh, emotional unhealth comes from. And so the idea is that the utopia, uh, the, the heaven that we're trying to get to is a place of, of um, unconstrained existence. No one can tell me what to do. No one can tell me how to be. I will, I will create my own identity. And I will do whatever it is I feel like doing. And I don't want anybody saying otherwise. Sin has been replaced by problems. It's not sin anymore, but there are some problems. And as Dr. Henry pointed out, they tend to be societal problems. If we could fix the educational problems, emotional problems, sexual problems, financial problems, racial problems, climatological problems, all these, if they can get fixed, uh, then everyone will be happy. And, and they can be fixed if everyone would think the way I think and do what I tell them to do. And, 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 and the, right. And this, so that's my next thing, is sin has also been replaced by victimhood. And victimhood says the problems are created by someone else. There's someone else has caused them and someone else needs to fix them. And I think that's rooted in a wrong view of sin. I'm not really. I mean, I do a few things wrong, but, the, but the, uh, it's those people out there, the really bad folks out there, they're the ones who've really uh, uh, made everything is, uh, bad, and they're the ones who need to straighten up. And then sin has also been replaced by failure. And this is kind of the other end of the spectrum. The goal is not sanctification, but success, which is defined by comfort, security, happiness, self-actualization, being entertained, and therefore, uh, if I'll just keep working hard, earning more, acquiring more stuff, seeing my 401k go uh, higher and higher and higher, if I can be a success, that's, that's the path to heaven. And if I just work hard enough and keep up with the Joneses hard enough, then I can get to that heaven. And the only sin is to fail at laying hold of what the world tells me uh, I need to be doing. And so since these are the ideas, and I believe these are pervasive in our culture, and they're, they run at, at, at perpendicular to the message of Christian theology about sin, uh, we have a, a message to share. So Western culture has rejected the idea of sin. Secondly, Western culture has rejected the purpose of image bearing. Uh, instead of viewing human beings as those who would flourish to bless the world, it's this belief that human beings exist to be happy and to do what feels good. So that's the, uh, that's the ultimate good. And so once again, when human beings say no to being image bearers, which is fundamental to human sinfulness, then we wreck and ruin the world. And then thirdly, Western culture and the rest of the world are sinful and condemned nevertheless. Even though people think these things and have these value systems and want to operate according to these principles that I've just named, the bottom line has not changed. They are sinful and they're condemned. And since that's the case, two things real quickly. Missions is still central. 
Sin is the fundamental problem and Jesus is still the fundamental answer. And one of the things the church has to navigate is they're being told, no, y'all need to get into, involved in all these social issues and that kind of thing. Fair enough. We, we want to be bringing redemption wherever we can bring redemption, but it rides in with Jesus. It's about Jesus first. And if we're not proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're not on mission. Because people's problems are not educational. They are not uh, financial. They are not uh, gender related. What is our people's fundamental problem? What's the problem? It's a spiritual problem. It's a sin problem. And so it's a Jesus answer. And we better be giving Jesus as part of our answer. And then secondly, people are incredibly broken by sin at every level. And the church needs to bring redemption to the redemption of Jesus at every level. So this is almost the flip side of what I just said. In our church, where we believe in missions and sharing the love of Jesus Christ, very often we just want to hand somebody a track and tell them Jesus loves you and, and then good luck. When people now come to us and they're, they are broken emotionally and their relationships are broken and they're, they're, um, they're hurt and injured in their history and they've got guilt and they've got problems that they're, they're wrecked financially. I mean, you, you know this. And so it's not biblical to say, well, we don't, we don't really do any of those kinds of problems. Uh, we, we really only deal with spiritual issues. You're on your own for the rest of it. God created the world in all of its, all of its glory and beauty. And, and we need to bring the love and power and redemption of Jesus at every level. Jesus will help put your marriage back together. Jesus will help put your financial life back together. Do you think Jesus will help put people's financial life back together? Yes, he will. You've got some good spiritual Christ-centered principles for that. And we need to be rearing and all that to bear. And then even into social issues. Um, racism is a sin and Christians ought to be doing something about it. All Mark says is just following Mark. <laughs> what does Jeremiah say about our heart? Deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can even understand it? That's right. And so, and I think people... Man... If there's a, a, a tree farm or a bakery, if you get a tree farm or a bakery in there, man, it's, it, it, there's snow, you got some snow in a Christmas tree, man, it's going to be good. Well, thank you. I know I've given you a, 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 a thousand different things to kind of go over. Next week, we'll uh, look at the solution to this deep sin problem, uh, and, and it's really going to get fun. So I hope you'll be uh, in your place. Pray for me tomorrow. I'm lecturing on uh, Ephesians at an association outside of Hattiesburg. Uh, and as usual, I can't seem to get myself to finish it. So when I finish here, I've got to go finish writing a set of lectures that I'm supposed to give tomorrow. Because I don't work better under deadlines. I work only under deadlines so uh, so but I'll be doing that we'll we'll see you on Sunday let me pray father we love you again we thank you that um, while we were sinners Christ died for us somebody in our lives needs to hear that tomorrow help us to have the courage to give your message about sin and salvation ask it in Jesus name amen